good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeff Flyer, Dean of Harvard Medical School, and it's really a great pleasure to welcome you all today to the Grand Rounds as we gather to address the current opioid crisis and together work towards solutions. It's certainly one of the most important and troubling public health challenges facing our communities and our nation today. Right now, four people die each day of opioid overdoses in Massachusetts alone, and since 2004, more than 6,000 have died in this state. Governor Baker's administration has recognized and quickly risen to the challenge, establishing the state's opioid addiction working group, which has taken a leading role in addressing this crisis. One of our HMS assistant professors in psychiatry, Todd Griswold at Cambridge Health Alliance, has been working with that state group, which includes professors and faculty from four Massachusetts medical schools. I'd also like to recognize at this time the work of the Massachusetts State Legislature, especially the leadership of State Senator John Keenan, who's with us today, and any other elected officials who might be here. Uh, thank you. We're all working to further develop our curriculum competencies so that we can improve how we teach future physicians better, pain medicine, prescription practices, and give them a more accurate understanding of the signs of addiction. And we're also working to destigmatize substance abuse disorders. Along with that, planning is ongoing as to how we'll integrate the new curriculum across all of our teaching hospitals and throughout the multiple clinical areas outside psychiatry. But as most of you are probably aware, solving this complex health problem is very difficult because prevention and treatment of opioid use disorder is intertwined with the many challenges involved in humanely supporting people who are struggling with chronic pain, addiction, and other behavioral health problems. In addition, many face structural barriers to good health, including poverty, homelessness, and other social challenges. But if there is one thing that we've learned through basic science, it's that solving the hardest, most complex problems requires collaboration and partnership across diverse labs, academic disciplines, and institutions. At HMS, we are working to marshal the considerable resources of our school, our affiliated hospitals, and our clinics, several of which are leaders in the treatment of addictions and behavioral health, along with our external education programs and our Center for Primary Care, all together to effectively confront and rapidly reverse this devastating epidemic. So all of this brings us back to the work of our meeting today and the introduction of our guest panelists. First, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Monica Burrell, Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Dr. Burrell's department is responsible for spearheading our state's response to the opioid crisis. Welcome back to Harvard, Commissioner Burrell. Next on our panel is Dr. Sarah Wakeman, an assistant professor of medicine here at HMS and medical director of the Mass General Hospital Substance Abuse, Substance Use Disorders Program. MGH developed this program as a new approach to opioid epidemic, and it has made it one of the highest clinical priorities of a hospital-wide strategic plan. Welcome, Dr. Wakeman. And our third guest panelist is Michael Duggan, who can speak very personally about the opioid crisis. An Arlington native, Michael is the founder of Wicked Sober, an organization that helps individuals and families struggling with addiction by connecting them with treatment resources. Welcome, Michael. <laughs> and finally, our very special guest today, let us all welcome U.S. Surgeon General, Vice Admiral Vivek Morthy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, that warm welcome. It is so nice to see so many friends in the audience. Bill Taylor, you in particular. 
uh, and so many others. Uh, Dean Flyer, thank you for that kind welcome and for welcoming me back to Harvard. It is really nice to be here. I have actually spent a lot of time in this room in particular. <laughs> and I remember um, so vividly as if it was yesterday just how many amazing experiences I've had in this system, training at Brigham Women's Hospital as a resident, working there as an attending, having the incredible privilege of teaching students during my time in residency. And, um, and all of that has just been an incredible privilege, and I'm reminded of that uh, when I come back here today. So I just want to thank you for that. I also want to tell you that uh, you, you, you probably know a lot about what the Surgeon General does, but I find often when I travel that people have heard about the Surgeon General. They know the Surgeon General exists, but they have no idea what I actually do. And I often find that people have these strange misconceptions. They recognize me from a box of cigarettes or from a bottle of alcohol. <laughs> and they think that's my main job, is stamping boxes and, and the bottles. <laughs> and it happens at least once uh, a week or so when we travel that I get mistaken for an American Airlines pilot because of the uniform. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm assuming all of you know better. <laughs> I do not work for an airline. Uh, but instead, my, my job as Surgeon General is twofold. It's to ensure that people in, across our country have the best possible information uh, that's scientifically grounded that they can use to improve their health. It's also to oversee the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, which is a group of 6,700 officers all around the country and, in fact, around the world in 800 locations who have dedicated their lives to improving public health in America. These are doctors and dentists, nurses and physical therapists, pharmacists, environmental health experts, veterinarians, and even public health engineers. And I bet you didn't know that they were public health engineers, but they actually are. Uh, and they respond during times of emergency, when there are hurricanes or tornadoes that compromise the health of our country. Uh, they also help <clears throat> ensure that on a day-to-day -day basis that our federal agencies are doing everything they can uh, to improve the public health of the nation. And that is actually the reason why I wear this uniform, is this is the uniform of the US Public Health Service Commission Corps. A few, I'm, I'm glad that we're all here today to talk about opioids, because a few days ago, I was in uh, Phoenix. And in Phoenix, I met an incredible young man uh, who works at a center called Community Bridges, which is a substance use uh, and addiction treatment center. And he told me this story of how when he was a young man, he felt like he didn't quite fit in. I always felt something was strange about him. Uh, and the first time he really felt normal or comfortable was when he took prescription opioids. And he remembers that moment vividly because it was the moment where he got hooked. And as he tells it, he began taking more and more of those prescription painkillers in the months and years of college. He even told me at one point that a couple of years after he finished high school, he was actually diagnosed with testicular cancer. And he went through a pretty major surgery. He was treated and was told that he, was, uh, that he would hopefully be OK. But three years later, he was found to have enlarged lymph nodes in his abdomen and was told that there was a recurrence of the testicular cancer. Now, for nearly anyone in this room, if we were in a position where we were told we had a recurrent cancer, our reaction would probably be one of sadness and dismay. But that wasn't the case with him. He was actually overjoyed. And he was overjoyed because he figured he'd need to have a major surgery and would likely get more prescriptions for opioid medications. He told me that story to illustrate just how powerfully addiction can take hold of your brain and impact the decisions that you make and corrupt your judgment. And that's what he experienced. That's what so many people living with addiction experience each and every day. So this is really quite profound. And when we look at the numbers, we find that there are over two, nearly 2 million people in our country who are addicted to prescription opioids. And we see that there are also millions more who are impacted by it, family members, friends, teachers, and people in communities, including doctors and nurses who are caring for these folks. The question is, how did we get here? Well, about 20 years ago, as many of you may well remember, clinicians were urged to treat pain more aggressively. But they were done, urged to do so often without being given the training and the tools that they needed to understand how to treat pain safely and effectively. This also coincided with heavy marketing of opioid medications to doctors. 
And many of us were even taught that opioids were not addictive as long as they were given to someone who had legitimate pain. I was having dinner with a friend who's a cardiologist down in Florida the other day, and I mentioned this to him over dinner. And he put down his fork, and he looked up, to me, uh, looked up at me, and he said, wait, you mean that's not true? And he was trained at one of the, some of the best programs in our country. So there's a lot that contributed to this problem. But what it's led to is unfortunately a quadrupling in overdose deaths since 1999. The quantity of opioids prescribed has also quadrupled since 1999, tracking very closely with the rise of the epidemic. So what does this mean? Well, it means something in very real human terms, because besides the numbers that tell uh, the epidemiology of the illness and how, how much it's costing us in terms of dollars, there's a very real human cost, a cost that I see very often when I travel around the country and talk to families, a cost that many of you see in your day-to-day -day clinical practice, uh, recognizing that so many of our patients, whether they come in with a primary complaint that's linked to addiction or not, often have addiction in the background, something that we have to be aware of and we have to manage if we want to improve their overall health. So what do we have to do uh, to get past this? Well, I think there are a few key things. Uh, and the good news is that a lot of this is actually being done in Massachusetts, which is uh, exciting and encouraging, and a reason why I think this state is a bright spot uh, in the country. But we have to ensure that we are sharpening our prescribing practices as clinicians so that we can prescribe opioids when necessary, but avoid them when they're not. We also need to ensure that we are expanding access to treatment, and that we are getting naloxone in the hands of people uh, who are at risk for overdose, uh, as well as first responders and, in some cases, family members. We have to educate the public. Many people in the public don't also recognize that opioids are addictive. As one patient's family told me, uh, a patient who sadly had a child who overdosed and died uh, from opioids, uh, her mother said to me, I got a prescription from the doctor, so I assumed it was safe. Why would our doctor ever give us something that could kill our daughter? That's what she said. And unfortunately, there's so many parents that have gone through a very similar experience. So we all know, as clinicians, that every medicine has benefits and potential risks. But when it comes to opioids, uh, it's clear that we have to do more to help the public understand what some of those risks are. And finally, what we also need to do, which is perhaps more difficult than anything else, is we have to change how our country thinks about addiction. We can't pass a law that will do that. We can't build a single program that will change attitudes around the country. But right now, there are too many people in America who think of addiction as a character flaw, as a moral failing. And as a result, it makes it harder for people who are living with addiction to come forth and ask for help. It makes it harder for people to accept treatment centers in their neighborhoods. There are so many people who would have no problem with a cancer treatment center being set up in their neighborhood or a heart disease treatment center. But when you talk about having a methadone clinic in their neighborhood, that's a whole different issue, and many of them are concerned about that. And why is that? It's in part because of how we think about addiction. So that's something that we have to change. And I, our office made a decision very early on in my term uh, that I would make this a priority uh, during 2016 and the years that followed. The reason is that partly because of my own clinical experience, seeing so many patients struggling with addiction. Part of it also had to do with nurses at Brigham and Women's Hospital, who on my last day, actually at the Brigham when I was leaving, uh, pulled me aside and said, Vivek, if you can do just one thing during your time as Surgeon General, please do something about the drug crisis in America, because it's tearing our communities apart. But I also decided to make this a priority because of the families that I met all around our country, families who said to me time and time again, please do something to help us. Our communities are struggling. So that's why I have made this a priority. That's also why President Obama has made this a priority, because he too has heard from families. He too has seen the pain and the cost of addiction all across America. So in addition to visiting communities like Boston, where we can talk about the challenges that we are facing, but also the solutions that we're implementing, uh, we, I will be next month issuing a letter to the 1.2 million prescribers of opioid medications in all 50 states, a letter that will urge our colleagues to join a movement we are building to turn the tide on the opioid epidemic. We will also urge practitioners to follow a key set of best practices, which will help them treat pain safely and effectively. And since, since as clinicians, we all love pocket cards, we'll also be including a pocket card in that letter. 
so that you can keep that in your white coat or increasingly in your black fleece, as many of us <laughs> seem to wear. And that's something that you can refer to that will help guide you uh, when you're making decisions about opioid medications. And later this year, uh, I will be issuing the first ever Surgeon General's report on substance use addiction and health. Surgeon General reports have been an important part of how we have addressed public health crises in this country. In 1964, my predecessor, Luther Terry, uh, who, by the way, lived in Brookline also, uh, but Luther Terry issued the country's first report on tobacco, uh, which began 50 years of activity in reducing smoking rates that helped us go from a smoking prevalence of 42% in 1964 to under 17% today. Still too high, but progress has been made. And the goal of our report will be to bring together the best available science on prevention, treatment, and recovery so that clinicians know what to do, so that policymakers know what to support, and so that families know how to approach their children or their loved ones when they're dealing with addiction. That's the purpose of our report. It's also to help us change how our country thinks about addiction. You know, in closing, I just want to share one last thought, which is a question about whose responsibility this is to solve. We have so many crises in America right now, and often when we think about them, we can ask ourselves, well, one, whose fault was it? And two, who should clean up the mess? But what I want to tell you with this problem, with the opioid crisis, is that this is not any one group's responsibility. This is all of our collective responsibility. This is a problem that can't be solved unless policymakers and clinicians work together with families and faith leaders to change not only how we think about addiction, but how we prevent and treat it. And this is, we have an especially important role, though, as clinicians to play here. And you might think, well, that's of course because we can prescribe. And if we can change prescription practices, then we can impact this epidemic. And you would be absolutely right. But I think there's something even bigger which makes it important that we in particular step up. And that's that over the centuries, society has accorded us a special place, a special degree of respect that comes from an appreciation for why we enter this profession in the first place. Many of us came to the healing arts because we wanted to relieve suffering, because we wanted to improve people's lives. And with that has come a moral responsibility to not only care for individual patients, but to step up and help address some of our country's most intractable public health problems when they arise. I learned early on when I was young, as an elementary school kid, sitting in my parents' office where they saw patients uh, day in and day out, that there was something more than the science that was contributing to that special look of respect and honor that my parents' patients accorded to them. My parents, my, their patients looked at them for hope and for help during times of hardship. Their community looked at them for hope and help during times of crisis. And the opioids crisis is one of those moments where the country is looking to our profession for hope and for help. And my desire, my hope, is that we will step up and that we will fulfill that responsibility. So part of the reason we're here today and why I'm so thrilled that we have a wonderful panel with us is that we want to talk through some of what's actually happening with this crisis and how we're addressing it here in Massachusetts. We want to talk a little bit about how individual clinicians can change their practice and can play a bigger role in fact, in helping to not only prevent addiction, but treat it as well, particularly with buprenorphine. And we want to hear a bit about the experiences of people who have lived through addiction and who have come out on the other side and helped show us that recovery is not only possible, but that the story of getting to recovery can be a source of empowerment for many, many others. So with that, I want to turn our discussion over uh, to, to the panel. I'm going to begin by addressing a couple of questions. And you can all still hear me, right? <laughs> I'm going to address, start by addressing a couple of questions to them, and then we're going to open it up to the audience so that all of you will have the time to, uh, to share some of your answers. All right, let's hope it stays. <laughs> so I want to start uh, our first question with, uh, with Dr. Barrell, our Commissioner of Health here in Massachusetts. Uh, first of all, Dr. Barrell, thank you so much for being with us today. And I, you have played multiple roles when it comes to medicine and public health during your career. 
Uh, you've been a clinician. You've treated patients with substance use disorders. Uh, and now you're also take, looking after the health of the entire state. So I'd like you to share a little bit with us about what approach Massachusetts is taking uh, to address the opioid epidemic. And in particular, how is this state interfacing with clinicians? Sure. Well, um, first, everybody, thank you all for being here. It's nice to see so many familiar faces. And I want to, on behalf of the Baker administration, welcome the Surgeon General here. It's quite an honor for us to have our national public health leader coming to Massachusetts to learn about what we're doing to battle this opiate crisis. As many of you know, this is the number one public health issue of our administration, and we are working very hard to bring down the death levels. The numbers are astounding. There are over 1,500 predicted deaths last year from opiate overdose, and that's over double just 2012. When we think about those numbers and the individuals behind them, we have come together, Governor Baker put us together as an opiate working group cross-sectorally, and we came up with 65 recommendations and a 19-step action plan that looked across the area of prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery, many of the points that Dr. Murthy raised to make sure that we address this issue across the sector. In prevention, we're talking about prevention, the full primary prevention, so that individuals, parents, students, coaches, community members understand the risks of opiate misuse. And then we're talking about prescribers. As many of you know, Massachusetts is, again, first in the nation to have all four medical school deans. We, um, thank you, Dr. Flyer, for your leadership on this. All four medical school deans and dental school deans have adopted a core competency, 10 core competencies that we will teach every medical and dental student before they graduate so that we're all starting with the same basic individuals <coughs> to enter their clinical practice. In interventions, we are looking at getting naloxone or Narcan throughout our communities. We're increasing the number of treatment beds, and we're working towards improving the options for recovery, including recovery homes and sober home living as many individuals find themselves tackling unemployment and homelessness as well as they struggle to get better. I will say the most important thing to me is our State Without Stigma campaign. And when Dr. Murthy and I earlier were to today were speaking with some patients, the first, when he asked them, what would it take for you, what, what advice do you have for individuals? And he spoke about his own struggles with getting the courage to tell people in his community or his medical provider or his own doctor that he had issues with substance use disorder because he was embarrassed. And for us, we have to get over this issue of the stigma. This is affecting all of us. We have to look at substance use disorder for the medical disease that it is. And until we get there, and that's both from us and our internal biases as prescribers as well as community members, um, until we get there, we won't be able to make sure that all of these services that we have are accessible to everyone. It's a big barrier, the stigma issue. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I certainly appreciate your efforts and the governor's efforts uh, in this state. So please convey our gratitude to him for what he is doing. Um, I, I want to turn to, to Dr. Wakeman uh, for a moment to give us a, a bit of a clinical perspective here. Um, you also have you've trained in, in medicine. You've um, seen the many facets of addiction. Uh, you've now come to a place where you're treating people who are living with addiction. And I want you to help us address something very practical here, because I find that when I speak to clinicians, and when I think about my own time practicing here at the Brigham, the prospect of treating patients with substance use disorders uh, seems like a monumental challenge. It seems like the amount of work and training that we've required to be able to do something like prescribing, is prescribe buprenorphine would be incredible. Uh, and this is even when you're sitting in an academic center where you have some additional sources of support. So what I'd love for you to demystify for us is what is treating substance use disorders actually like? If we want substance use disorder treatment to be part and parcel of training for everyone in medicine, do you think it's practical for someone who's practicing primary care medicine right now to take on substance use disorder treatment? So I'd love for you to comment a little Great. bit on this. 
Thank you, and thank you so much for being here and for having me. It's an incredible honor to be on this panel. Um, so I think that's a great question. I actually was a primary care resident. I trained in the primary care program at Mass General Hospital, um, and I'm a primary care physician, and I'm board certified in addiction medicine. So I do both, and I would say that treating addiction is both the single most rewarding thing I do in medicine and one of the easier things that we do in medicine. Um, you know, as internists and as specialists, we take care of very complex chronic medical disease that has components of behavioral um, parts of people's lives genetic risk, um, and sort of fundamental biology. And, and addiction is exactly that. So I actually think diabetes is sort of the perfect metaphor for both how we deliver care and what the disease is. So addiction is as genetically um, inherited as diabetes. It's about 50% based on your genes. And like diabetes, there's some components of lifestyle or exposure. Um, and then there's a lot of biology. So patients who have addiction, their brain is fundamentally changed. And the story that you described is a perfect description of what happens, that by definition, people who are in in the throes of addiction behave irrationally. And I think that's one thing that's so hard for family members and for the public to understand, this idea of sort of why can't they just stop? And literally the part of our brain that helps us make decisions about choice and to weigh risk and benefit and think about consequences gets damaged in addiction. And the good news is that recovery happens. Actually, most people with addiction will get better. It's a, a totally treatable illness. Um, but it takes time, like other chronic diseases. And if patients die before they get there, obviously, we've lost the battle. And so, um, so I think the approach is very much what we do in primary care every day. It's meeting the patient where they are. It's patient-centered. Um, it's a shared decision-making process around what type of treatment works for that patient. And it's a combination of medication and behavioral interventions or lifestyle interventions. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you know, it maps out perfectly onto what we're doing. But the big thing is stigma, and that's what Commissioner Brown mentioned. And um, with medication treatments in particular, <coughs> I was actually on a panel earlier this week um, with a gentleman who's in long-term remission on buprenorphine. He's been in remission for eight years. And he said that it was harder for him to tell his family that he was on buprenorphine than it was for him to come out as a gay man, mm -hmm. that he felt such intense stigma around the use of medications. And I have many patients who are doing fabulously in recovery. They're working wonderful jobs. And they don't tell anyone that they're on this life-saving medication because they've received this message that um, somehow that treatment is not valid. And so I think fighting stigma, not just with the disease, but actually with the types of treatment that we offer people is crucial. Well, that's very, very powerful. And I, I would also just want to flag for folks that when you actually look at how much time it gets takes to get trained in administering buprenorphine for the waiver, it's actually about eight hours. Mm -hmm. That's the length of the training. Uh, so it's achievable. It's actually easy to do. And it's incredibly gratifying. This is the piece, I think, that is that many clinicians who have not actually engaged in treatment uh, don't necessarily understand, is that we, we are living in a time where physicians are burning out at very high rates. And part of the reason that we're burning out is we often don't feel we have the tools and the time to treat the challenges that our patients have. And that lack of self-efficacy, when it happens year after year after year, can burn people out. And if training and treatment actually gives you the ability to have impact, and I believe that impact is one of the most powerful antidotes to burnout. When you feel like you can actually have a positive impact on a patient's life, uh, that gives you energy. It gets you excited. It renews uh, your sense of mission and purpose. And so I would certainly love to see more clinicians, especially primary care clinicians, getting trained uh, in buprenorphine treatment. That's part of what we're trying to encourage uh, training institutions uh, to do as well. Yeah. So thank you for sharing yeah, that. Thank you. I, I want to turn to, uh, to Michael. Uh, from my, Michael, you have uh, an extraordinary story, uh, a story not just of how you worked through addiction and came out on the other side but a story of how you've turned pain uh, into a passion for helping other people. And I think it's really extraordinary. And I would love for you to, we've had, I've had the chance to hear your story uh, when we were down in, uh, in Atlanta at the RX Summit. But I would certainly love for you to share uh, some of your experiences and the journey that you went through uh, with the folks who are here today. Awesome. Um, well, thank you for the introduction. It's, uh, it's an honor to be on the panel with, um, with the yeah, uh, doctors as well. I'm also an MD on my initials, you know, Mike Duggan. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to put that out there. Probably longer than a lot of people in this room. Um, <laughs> so very excited to be here. Great discussion so far. Happy to, to participate in as well. Um, you know, my story certainly isn't unique, especially for a lot of the stories we hear today. Grew up in a typical Irish Catholic family. There was a lot of alcoholism, a lot of addiction. Um, you know, grew up playing sports for a long time. That was my outlet. You know, that's where I found myself. Um, and 
I just want to make something clear. What I share is my experience and my experience only, and there's a lot of paths to recovery. Um, I'm a person in long-term recovery. What that means to me is I haven't had a drink of drugs since April 14, 2009. Uh, so very grateful to recently celebrate seven years in recovery. <laughs> It's weird looking up at everybody. I feel like everybody's looking down on me right now. Shame on all of you. Um, but in terms of, of the process I went through, um, I just want to make something clear that the experimentation of alcohol and marijuana certainly played a big part of that and how old I was when I experimented with both of those drugs um, and the, you know, the increase of uh, likelihood of me developing a substance use disorder, especially with the introduction of prescription pain medication um, when I broke my wrist uh, from a hockey injury senior year. Uh, playing hockey. And at that time, I remember the experience, it was um, the uh, first solution to the pain was uh, prescription opioids. And um, there was no lesser alternative given. There was no family history that was drawn. There was no questions asked or other alternatives that were discussed. Um, it was also during the time that OxyContin had uh, first started coming around in the early 2000s. And I think uh, at that time, based on mismarketing practices, it was prescribed for uh, moderate pain. Um, and when I kind of had that introduction, um, you know, it certainly um, paved the way uh, in a lot of ways for my decision making afterwards without even realizing the control it had over my thinking. And um, shortly after that, uh, first interaction, I had surgery on my wrist uh, to repair nerve damage, and uh, the solution to the pain after the surgery was more prescription pain medication, and then after that, I also had my wisdom teeth pulled, and the prescription for the pain was prescription pain medication. Um, at that age, it was easier for people my age that, that I knew when I grew up with to access pain medication, either legally or illegally, uh, than it was to get somebody to buy them alcohol as an underage individual. And... Um, the process for me uh, had many detours, let's say, uh, many different paths that I had taken. Um, I personally have been on Suboxone. I've personally been on the Vivitrol. I've personally been on Methadone. Um, so I certainly tried different uh, you know, attempts at getting myself uh, clean and sober. Um, one thing I will mention is my first experience in a detox program, I remember them asking me the question, uh, what are your plans when you get out of here? Uh, my planning got me in there. Um, so I just want to make that clear. The last thing I think that anybody really should have been asking me at that time were what my plans were, because a lot of the information that I was getting was coming from people that I was using drugs with versus people who were healthcare professionals that were properly educating me on options and resources that were available to me. Um, and I would tell them or direct them as far as what you know direction I was going to uh, choose to go down. And um, you know that that obviously uh, created a lot of pain and a lot of situations that I wish I never went in uh, went into. But um, at the end of the day, there was uh, a light at the end of the tunnel. Fortunately, I'm I'm here to share a story of recovery of, of hope, um, having the opportunity to uh, receive uh, proper long term treatment. Um, and I think the 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 biggest uh, problem um, and the reason why I founded Wicked Sober was. Um, if you look at addiction as a disease of unmanageability, and if you look at addiction as a disease of isolation, those two things, if you look at success that 12-step programs have, for example, part of the 12-step program is admitting that your life is unmanageable. And I think society as a whole um, had unrealistic expectations expecting me to manage my own care and get myself well. Um, and I think we were falling short on the lack of support services in between the coordination amongst treatment, um, which was important. So we started a hotline in order to work with individuals in the system in the process of navigating them and connecting them to resources. Um, you know, I remember being in a program and, and being discharged with a phone number list saying, here you go, um, these are some options for you. Um, and a lot of times I never made those phone calls, or when I did, I would quickly find out that there was limited bed availability, which would cause me now to uh, either give up in the process and use because I wanted to avoid withdrawal or um, wait or delay it until unfortunately maybe something happened, a consequence happened that maybe stopped me in my tracks. And another reason why we started Wicked Sober was for the families. Um, 
my mother is a very intelligent woman. She's a nurse in Mass General Hospital. Uh, but when it came to addiction, um, she was getting a lot of the advice from me. There's a lot of stim mm -hmm. stigma, there's a lot of guilt, and there's a lot of shame within the family. And places she would call, nobody would give her uh, any information saying they need to speak to me directly, um, which was unrealistic at the time. Um, so we do a lot of work with families, put together treatment plans, coach them on education, uh, I coach them on support groups that they can attend, like Learn to Cope, which you recently addressed as well, um, and uh, where to obtain <coughs> nasal naloxone, Narcan, uh, and uh, provide intervention services and help them talk to their loved ones as well, so. Well, thank you, Mike, for not just your story, but for all you're doing to help other people as well. Thank you. Appreciate that. You mentioned uh, naloxone and the nasal uh, Narcan as well, and as it turns out, I have some demos right here for those of you who may not have seen this. Now, I, the reason I bring this is because I think many of us who see patients have had the experience of having, seeing a patient in clinic <coughs> or in the hospital and asking the patient, so what medications are you on? And they can't tell you the medicines, but they pull out a handful of pills that are blue and red and pink and white. And they say, well, you probably knows what the, know what these are. These are my medications. <laughs> and of course, in the back of your head, you're thinking, I have no idea what these are because I don't know what they look like. Well, it turns out that part of what we're trying to do is ensure that more people have access to naloxone. So I wanted to make sure people knew uh, what these actually looked like. So what I have uh, here are an injectable uh, dispenser for Narcan uh, and also a, a nasal uh, dispenser for Narcan. And this is relatively new, uh, the nasal formulation. But these are relatively easy to use. And it turns out that it actually gives you instructions that you can hear. And how many of you have actually seen this before and used it? So just a few people. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take it out, and then I'm going to hold it up to the mic so you hear what it actually says. This trainer contains no needle or drug. Precautionary. Note. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this off. Black end against outer thigh. Then press firmly and hold in place for five seconds. Right. Monica, you mind if I demo on you? There's no need. To inject. Injection complete. And that's literally it. This trainer may be reused. Oh, let's make sure this quiets down a little bit. Hold on. <laughs> This is always the hardest part of the demo is getting it to <laughs> quiet down again. But, you know, there we go. This is the, the nasal uh, application. And here, this is actually fairly simple. What you do is you hold it with two fingers, put your thumb behind, uh, which is where the, uh, the release is. And then you, you, put, you insert this into one nostril. Either one doesn't matter. And then you just simply push on the back, and that dispenses the medication. You just need to give one dose. This is a one-dose cartridge. And then you wait two to three minutes to see if there's a response. And if there isn't, then you can give another dose, both of the intranasal one, and also you can give a second dose of the injectable as well. So it's that simple. Now, different states have different rules around Narcan. Some states, uh, it's, it's actually quite hard to find. Others uh, have made it uh, much more easily applicable. In Baltimore, for example, they have a standing uh, prescription where you can, anybody could walk in and actually get naloxone, whether you're using opioids or not, because we know that many times family members play an important role in administering this uh, to their loved ones. Uh, so this is uh, what Narcan is about. But I also just want to touch on one thing that, that Mike said, which is about um, the treatment, uh, the, the phone numbers that you said you were given uh, several times when you were in the hospital. I'm willing to bet that every clinician in the room has had the experience <laughs> of sending a patient out with a phone number to call for help mm -hmm. and knowing somewhere in the back of your head that it was very unlikely that they would actually be able to use that. And that feels really, really bad because you feel like, gosh, I really know there's more this person needs and I can't actually provide it. So I'm making both of us feel better by just giving the phone number. And what that points to is the fact that if we really want to provide uh, how the help that people need, if we really want to tackle the problem of addiction, we have to ensure that the full set of wraparound services are available. And whenever we talk about more services, it sounds like more money. It sounds like, well, where are we going to get the money for it? Well, what I would say is that we can't actually afford not to do that, because we are paying far more uh, in terms of emergency room visits, in terms of lost productivity, 
uh, in terms of human suffering uh, than we could be if we only invested more uh, in the treatment side. And that's one of the reasons why uh, President Obama actually made it a point in his budget request for the next year uh, to request over one, uh, about $1.1 billion in new funds to fight the opioid epidemic. And a significant portion of that is going to expanding treatment. If that funding was actually, <clears throat> if, it's, uh, if it's actually funded by Congress, about up to $20 million of those funds would actually come to Massachusetts uh, as well. But this is why those funds are so important. It's because it's about providing the kind of follow-up services, wraparound services, uh, that folks like Michael and so many others need uh, when they're dealing with addiction. I want to now just turn to our audience. We have time for, for a few questions. So let's see if anyone would like to ask anything. Sure, right over here. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming to speak at Harvard. My name's Daniel Beck, and I'm a fourth year medical student here. And I recently completed the eight hour Suboxone training here as part of a pilot study. And I'm also a member of the Student Coalition on Addiction in Massachusetts, and we completed a statewide survey that showed a serious gap between wanting to be trained in order to treat patients with substance use disorders and actually having the skills to treat patients with substance use disorders. Given this gap in training, would you support Suboxone training being integrated into the medical student curricula across all states nationwide? I would. I think it's important for all clinicians to, to know how to treat substance use disorders. You know, if you think about it, whether you're a cardiologist or a dermatologist or an ophthalmologist, you're given basic training in how to adjust blood pressure medications. And you're, you're given that training because even if you don't use it every day, uh, it's a basic skill set that we have to have, especially given the prevalence of hypertension. Substance use disorders are becoming increasingly prevalent. And what is clear also is that people living with substance use disorders don't always have easy access to the medical system. What that means is that we should be moving toward essentially a no wrong door policy, whereby any interaction with the healthcare system enables someone living with addiction to be able to encounter someone who can provide them with treatment. And so that's why, yes, I would be supportive of expanding our treatment and making this and thinking about substance use treatment as part of the basic toolkit that every clinician should have. Thank you all so much for the wonderful work that you uh, have been doing and for addressing us today. This has been a great discussion. Um, my name is Scott Hadlin, and I work as an adolescent medicine physician and addiction medicine physician here at Boston Children's. And um, Mike, your story really resonated with me because I see a lot of patients in exactly the position that you found yourself in. Um, I can think of a 16-year-old patient uh, who I started on buprenorphine a couple of weeks ago. And I remember sitting there, starting him on the medication because he'd been struggling with, with methadone and other pills that he had been buying off the street. And as I was doing the induction, he was sitting there reading a Harry Potter book. And I remember thinking this is such a juxtaposition of something that we think of as a typically adult disorder um, combined with you know, somebody reading a book that's, that's made for children um, in my exam room. And so my question for, for the whole panel is, um, what thoughts do you have and what efforts are we making at the local, state, and national level to address prevention and treatment for young people since we know that the life course trajectory of these things starts quite early? Did you want to speak first? No. Were you directing the question to Michael? Yeah. Um, well, I think a lot of us can it certainly touch base in different aspects to that question. Uh, one thing I just want to uh, mention in terms of, of medication-assisted treatment is medication isn't the treatment. Um, the assisted treatment aspect to, to that as well is very important. Um, when I went to an outpatient program, I would go to a Suboxone doctor, and then I would go to a Vivitrol doctor or go to a, somebody who prescribed me methadone. I think we have to provide all options um, to find out what's going to be best for the individual, not necessarily what's going to be best for the provider, uh, prescriber. And um, in terms of uh, where stigma can be a huge problem is um, if you're referring out to an abstinence-based program as part of your treatment uh, when you're you know, on a medication like uh, buprenorphine, um, that may not be something that an individual feels necessarily comfortable in versus um, being in a group with other people that are on the similar type medication that they are as well, um, receiving treatment. I think that happens a lot. 
Um, in terms of, of work, as of right now, there's a ton of advocacy work and grassroots uh, organizations that are uh, going into a lot of the high schools, a lot of the middle schools, and having a conversation. Um, so that's obviously very important. Um, there's still that, that concern that a lot of parents have that they don't want to have the conversation with their children. Um, you know, they think it's too early to have that conversation as well. So we still have to overcome, you know, those obstacles when we go into the schools and we speak to, speak to the students. Um, a big problem for me in terms of, of the possible directions that I, take, uh, that I had taken was addiction is a chronic illness and it needs to be treated as such. Um, and there was limited case management services that were done. I know you had mentioned how much we're costing by not doing anything differently. And um, a lot of times it's detox only, which detox is a, you know, a quick fix solution that we're providing the highest level of care and providing the most expensive services. And we're discharging an individual with no follow-up care. Um, so we're really missing the wraparound services um, and the case management services to work with people on a long-term basis, providing them a continuum of care. And I think that's where we still fall very short, but we're making uh, extreme strides in, in the right direction, which is good. Let's see if we can fit in maybe a couple last questions. Go ahead. Um, thank you so much. It's truly a privilege to be here and a part of your leadership around these issues, um, Tim General Murthy and, and our panel. Um, my name is Patrick Lima, primary care doctor at Lynn Community Health Center. Uh, I've also trained at the uh, Mass General Hospital and practice at Mass General. And I wanted to make a point about and ask a question about the integration of services. So we all know that pain is multidisciplinary, and there are many ways to treat it other than opiates. And I can think about the difference in my practice at Chelsea Health Center and Lynn Community Health Center, where we have the privilege of being set up with a really rich set of behavioral health services so that when I meet a patient uh, with addiction or with a, um, a perhaps inappropriate opiate, benzodiazepine use, for example, um, I can tap colleagues for warm handoffs to assess um, whether they're catastrophizing around the pain, whether there are behavioral components around that, whether we're appropriately addressing uh, various traumas in a trauma-informed way. Um, I feel able to provide the care I need for my patients without having to own that all in a 15-minute visit. Um, we also have team structures so that patients are reviewed on a, week, a monthly basis who are high risk and um, will have the support of a team's recommendations as I go back to a patient to explain why we may need to move them off those co-prescribing or, or dose, reduce their low level of dose. And so how do, we, how do we think about the structures of integration that support the ability of us to provide the care um, uh, at, the, at the point of care? Um, um, so, Pat, I'll address that a little bit. Nice to see you. Um, so, you know, I think part of the reason of coming to you here as this group is the answers are here. So we know that team-based care is good for diabetes. We know that engaging multiple disciplines across different sectors, even outside of medicine, is the way to take care of people with cardiac disease best or cancer survivors. The same holds true for substance use disorder. You know models of care, as I do, where the behavioral health is integrated directly into the primary care, and those are the best models and the most successful. So for you all as leaders in the field of medicine, I would ask you to think about ways to get these models and these best practices and enhance them throughout the system. Because I think this is a real opportunity for us to finally get issues of behavioral health illness incorporated as they should be in primary care in a holistic way. Thank you. Uh, Scott Sigmund. I'm a practicing orthopedic surgeon here in uh, Massachusetts, also a member of uh, Governor Baker's new Chronic Pain Management Commission. Um, so elective surgery, and, and Mike's story is a, is a very common one, has become an inadvertent gateway to uh, the substance use problem. And as many as one out of 15 people that are exposed to opioids in the setting of elective surgery will go on to substance use. So we're doing you know, a, a really great job here trying to re-educate our physicians. And we now want to also try to educate our patients to have them empowered to recognize that there are opioid alternatives that are out there. For example, I, I use liposomal bupivacaine with excellent success and really uh, dramatically reducing the need for post-operative narcotics. One of the problems that we're seeing here in Massachusetts as well as across the country is that the cost of the uh, use of the medication is considered too much. We have siloed pharmacy budgets. We have hospital administrators who are saying uh, it's too much money on the front side. And I guess the, the question I have is for a strategy as to try and balance the amount of money used for prevention 
to say down the road, can we save lives and can we uh, also reduce the overall all cost to society? So are there strategies that we can talk about where we can uh, balance that out with prevention? I well, certainly appreciate that comment. I think <clears throat> what you shared is actually a concern I hear all, our, all around the country, which is that the alternatives sometimes cost more than the opioids, mm -hmm. whether that's uh, IV Tylenol or whether it's uh, going to PT three times a week and having to dish out a copay each time you go, uh, which is no more time and more money. So I, there's certainly an issue here. And I think part of what, what we are working on, I think what we need to collectively work on, is in having more conversations with payers about how we shift and change what we pay for, recognizing that investing more in lowering the cost of uh, some of these alternatives up front can save us a lot more costs down the line. But I think this is also uh, points to the importance, again, of, of integration. Uh, because th the more we have integration with different elements of our healthcare delivery system, I think the easier, easier it is for us to understand the costs and benefits of different, different decisions we make. Um, many of us have operated in a fairly siloed uh, you know, universe when it comes to practicing medicine. Uh, and we can see, even on a small scale, uh, that when you have consult services that don't talk to each other, that can cause a tremendous pain for everyone that can cause increases in length of stay, that can cause increases in complications. Um, so I think the integrated systems that some of which we saw earlier today at um, Boston Healthcare for the Homeless and also at the, um, uh, you know, at the Boston Medical Center, uh, these are great examples, I think, of how we need to bring services together. But they have to also be combined with conversations with payers. And that's part of what we are, we're trying to drive now. Um, I think that there are, there's a recognition that uh, there are many folks who probably contributed to this problem over time, but now it's our time to all come together and chip in uh, and make sure that we're a part of supporting this solution. I know that our time has uh, nearly run out, so let me just take one more question, then I'll take a comment uh, at the end. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, I really want to first start off by saying that I love your hashtags, so I've used Step It Up, uh, and now Turn the Tide. Is, is, is great because I'm from New Bedford, and so we're in New Bedford, one of the small cities in Massachusetts that's struggling with the opioid crisis. Uh, I'm Dr. Mike Rocha, I'm a cardiologist. Um, I'm actually not from Harvard, I'm a UMass <laughs> Medical Center grad, and I actually trained at Tufts. But, um, you know, we, we really are struggling in our community, and one of the things that we've tried to look at is how do physicians in a community setting, because we're here in an academic setting, and how do we come together in communities where we need to be on the ground to get that done? And I'm gonna share with you what we're doing in New Bedford. What we've done over the last several months is we've put a coalition of doctors together from all subspecialties, cardiology, uh, anesthesiology, emergency room physicians, and we've decided to uh, embrace the turn the tide and what we were trying to do and exactly the things that you're talking about at the community level, we're talking about advocacy. So what has to change in our community, how we can connect with people outside of our community, public health education, which we've already showed the movie, If Only, and had James Wahlberg come down to our community to get that conversation going with the kids, and also to improve physician pain medication uh, practices. And last night we actually had 85 doctors at a restaurant in, in New Bedford that had a continuing medica medical education uh, meeting last night with da Dr. David Cassavance from Boston Children's Hospital. And we met with our mayor. So what we recognize is that when we have tremendous power when we work together. And I think that's one of the things as physicians that sometimes we forget is that we work in our own offices, our own emergency rooms, our own operating rooms, and that when we really come back to what we're supposed to be doing is to help and serve our patients, if we just show up and care with hope and compassion, we can make a big difference. And what I'm gonna ask is that how do we leverage our practitioners in the community to come together in a way that we aren't reaching right now? Now we can talk about it at the public health level, but how do we interact with public health and the clinicians better? That is a really good question. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on that. But let me do one thing, if you don't mind. I'm going to hold your question for a moment. I want to get a comment here, and then I'm going to come back and answer your question. OK, and, and we'll wrap up the session. I, I want to just give a moment uh, to, um, 
to Shoma and to Blaine, uh, who are two of our partners who are here, and because I, I want them to share something that, that they're helping us work with us on. Uh, Shoma is from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and also Blaine is from PHFE. And both of them have been incredibly important partners for us in building this Turn the Tide campaign. And in addition to sending the letter and the pocket card out that I mentioned, we are also creating a, a website where we can have uh, clinicians go to understand what other clinicians are doing, to hear some of their stories about how they changed their practice, where they can also hear the stories of patients who encountered clinicians who helped them, where they can print out materials that they can share with patients, a simple way to educate uh, people who are coming through their door. So I want to give Shoma and Plain a chance to, uh, to share a little bit about that. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to be partnering with you in this. And in many ways, uh, Mike, your question is at the heart of what we're doing, which is to say, how can we really think about the fact that this needs, as the Surgeon General said, a community-wide approach? And we need, and if it takes a community-wide approach, we need ways to bring community together across healthcare, public health, patients, community members. And so at 100 Million Lives, what we've been doing is building some of the tools, the resources to make that possible for people, and also for people as, for instance, the, uh, the state without stigma. What a, what a fantastic thing to do, or what Wicked Sober is doing. How could we make these bright spots visible to everybody across the country so that New Bedford might be inspired by what Wicked Sober is doing and what Boston is doing and Boston might be inspired by what New Bedford is doing and what a community in Alabama might find uh, at, that they develop um, can actually help to accelerate our collective um, work together. 100 Million Healthier Lives is all about creating unprecedented collaborations that recognize that people with lived experience community members and community leaders across sectors all the way to the federal level all need to be part of creating the solutions together. And it's just an absolute honor to be helping to partner in this way to address uh, what, it, as a primary care physician, I found in my patients to be one of the most challenging issues of our time. And I just thank the Surgeon General's office for taking this on and for doing it so intentionally and in a way that is so humane in the way in which it calls people to action. <coughs> Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great honor to be here um, this afternoon uh, to address this devastating health crisis that you've heard this afternoon affects all of our communities, from South Boston to Cambridge to Paisley Park. And I really want to applaud the Surgeon General for taking a bold and innovative approach um, in moving us from awareness to action. I'd also like to acknowledge three of our PHFB board members who are here with us today. You know, as an infectious disease physician by training, I come from a world of HIV where no one really believed in 1991 that 25 years later, that is to say in 2016, the end of the AIDS epidemic in cities like Boston and New York would be a realistic discussion that we might be having. Uh, however, those discussions are taking place today because as you've heard, when we come together in collaborative uh, and meaningful ways, uh, we can tackle even the most intractable public health challenges. And that is our call today to action, as you've heard uh, from the Surgeon General in this wonderful panel. As a national nonprofit agency that provides program and support services to optimize population health, PHFE, or Public Health Foundation Enterprises, was thrilled when the Surgeon General reached out and approached us to take the lead with IHI in building a different and dynamic partnership and an innovative digital platform to reach prescribers in addressing the opioid crisis in America. This collaboration and our support in bringing together the talent and resources to build this new platform, um, creating a digital home for this work is a natural fit for us. PHFE's service model is built on advancing evidence-based programming through partnerships with academic researchers, innovative public-private consortia, and government agencies so that we can bring lasting structural change that improves the health of communities. And we do this in a variety of ways. Um, we bring pilots, evidence-based pilots to scale, partnering on innovative social media and marketing as we have done here, building creative fellowship opportunities, uh, and also, Sorry. Uh, providing fiscal sponsorship or grant development and administrative support for large research and population health initiatives. PHFE currently partners with researchers at UCSF and the San Francisco Department of Health to better understand key aspects of this crisis, including evaluating trends 
in local opioid overdose death, overdose death rates and analyzing this impact of change in prescriber practices and illicit opioid initiation and overdose. Additionally, PHFE supports the LA Community Health Project, which provides overdose prevention and naloxone training throughout Southern California, links those affected by drug use to primary health care, offers hepatitis C testing, uh, and provides other kind of outreach and support. Most recently, we have partnered with IHI's 100 Million Healthy Lives to exchange promising evidence-based strategies and outcomes from our work uh, with other organizations that are seeking to make meaningful and impactful change around the world. These uh, partnerships and others are more completely described on our website, phfe.org, and I invite you to visit our website and follow us on our social media channels. Finally, it's clear to me, and I hope it will be to you today, that in reaching out to two large nonprofit organizations whose mission center on collaboration with partners across all sectors, that, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, that the Surgeon General is sending an unequivocal message that business for, as usual for us as physicians will not be enough to reverse the wor worsening opioid crisis in America. We now need to partner in new ways, as you've heard today, across silos of institutions, research areas, research sectors, harnessing cutting-edge technologies and communication platforms, educating ourselves and others in evidence-based strategies that can be brought to scale so that we can apply our best skills and talents toward turning the tide at this most, on this most unfortunate epidemic as we have done with other public health epidemics in our recent past. So in collaboration with the Office of the Surgeon General, PHFE stands ready to embark on this journey with all of you, and we thank the Surgeon General and this wonderful panel for your help today. Thank you. Well, I want to I thank everyone for coming today and for participating in this conversation. I want to thank in particular our wonderful panelists, Dr. Burrell, uh, Dr. Wakeman, uh, and Michael Duggan for sharing some of their experiences and perspectives with us. And I just also want to say, just in, in closing and in, partly in response to, to your uh, question, Adaroka, it was a perfect question to, to actually end on because you brought up the issue of power. And one thing that I have often thought of over the years is that clinicians are looked at by people on the outside as people who have tremendous power and influence. But many clinicians themselves feel disempowered. They feel like they're being asked to do more and more with less and less. They feel that they're seeing problems that are bigger than the skill set that they have to apply to those problems. And as time goes on, people feel like they're operating in large institutions that often don't care that much about them, uh, that they can't actually influence. And there's a strange dichotomy between the power that people think we have and the power we sometimes feel we have. But the truth, I think, is that we do have more power than we believe. I had a member of Congress tell me once <clears throat> that they, he got constituent calls all the time. But he would say if in one day, one call came in from a doctor that was listed as a notable event. He said if 10 calls came from doctors on a given day, that was a full-blown crisis. And it just went to show how infrequently uh, members of Congress actually hear from clinicians. But I will tell you from my experiences even long before I was a Surgeon General, that I have seen time and time again when clinicians take an issue up uh, of importance, whether it's substance use disorders, whether it's mental health, whether it's violence, that communities listen, that they care, and they need and appreciate that leadership. Because our voices are more powerful than we often realize, and we have the ability to affect more change uh, than we sometimes recognize. So I want us to think about that because to overcome this epidemic, we're actually going to have to do that kind of organizing. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to come together in communities and not only help each other change our clinical practice, but we'll have to demand what it is that we and our patients need. If that's better reimbursements for alternatives to opioid medications, then that may be it. If it's more integrated services so that we don't have to send a patient out with just a phone number and just hope for the best, then that integration is what we have to fight for. If it's more funding for a treatment programs so that people can actually get medication-assisted treatment, then that is what we have to fight for. But I want you to know now being on the a different side of the fence uh, and sitting inside government 
But I can tell you firsthand that when clinicians speak up, people do listen, even if it doesn't feel like it. And especially on a local level, you do have the ability uh, to change how we operate and how we do business. But it takes us stepping out of our comfort zone often. It takes us stepping out of the role that we were trained to play. And I would love in the future to see medical students and residents trained not only in how to provide care to patients, but in how to advocate for them, especially when they can't speak up for themselves. That's a skill that's essential to all of us. When we look back in 20 years, I want us to be able to look at this moment and say that this was an inflection point in time. This was a time where the country woke up to the magnitude of the opioid crisis, where we realized just how many lives were being destroyed by it, but also a moment where we decided to do something about it. And I want this to be a moment where we as clinicians in particular can look back and say that this was the time where we stepped up to take that role upon us that society so often wants us to step into, a role as a leader, a role as an advocate, uh, a role where we can help change what's happening in our communities and ultimately create a foundation for better health. So I want to thank all of you for your interest in being part of that movement that we are building to turn the tide on the opioid epidemic. I want to thank you also for the work that all of you do each and every day to better health, whether it's for individual patients or whether it's for the entire state of Massachusetts. <laughs> uh, and certainly we are looking forward to having all, all of you uh, join the movement when you, get, you should get the letter in July. Uh, and even if you don't get it uh, in the mail, uh, We'll make sure that it's sent out through as many organizations as possible so that you can sign up, so that you can take that pledge, and so that you can join physicians from all 50 states who want to be a part of the solution. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dean Flyer. It was great to be with all of you today. I appreciate it.